Welcome, everyone. My name is Shane Farmer, and I have the privilege of being your host over the next five weeks for this brand new exciting series called Wiser Together. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us for what is sure to be an amazing journey. Each week, we're going to gather together to receive practical training from Pastor Bill Hybels on how we can come together in a way that really changes lives. And in our first session titled, Walking with the Wise, we're, we're gonna be hearing a framework for the kind of small group that accomplishes God's purposes in our lives. For me, I've been in one small group for over six years now, and I simply cannot imagine living out my faith without this group. We have celebrated the highs of weddings and baby boys and baby girls and new exciting jobs, but we've also walked with each other through the lows of losing loved ones, miscarriages, and loss of employment. But most of all, none of us are the same person we were when we entered the group. We've all learned how to be better Christ followers, better husbands, better dads, and better employees because of the influence the group has had in our lives. And it's my hope that all of you could be a part of a group like mine. For some of you, that's already your reality, but for others of you, this is just getting started. Because this series is more than just doing a study together, it's about doing life together, the other people in your group have as much to do with your experience as the teaching materials themselves. Please place just as much focus on getting to know each other as you are in getting to know the content. Your group host has graciously opened up their place to get the group started. But we want everyone to get involved in order to make this experience awesome for everybody. So we'd like some of you to bring refreshments, maybe have the group at your house one week, or facilitate the discussion for a week of this series. In the back of your study guide, you're gonna find a group calendar. And as your group host passes around the calendar, we want everyone to sign up for something. And then be sure to make a note on your own calendar as a reminder. And while you're exploring the back of your book, you're also gonna find a group roster. It's important for you to be able to contact each other between meetings. So as you're passing around the group calendar, go ahead and add your contact information to the group roster as well. Think of this as like your old yearbook signing party from way back when. Go ahead, the DVD's gonna pause in a moment. Be sure to fill out the calendar and the roster. Introduce yourselves if you haven't already, and then take out your guides and get ready to follow along as Pastor Bill Hybels will discuss the significance of community in the Christian faith. If you don't hang out with wise people, friends, the influence of others will just seep into your life in a way you don't want it to happen. I have a friend who's very fond of saying, very few of us can run with a bad set of dogs and not get fleas. It's really true. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, bad company corrupts good morals. I have a friend who's a recent Christian and I've been trying to coach him out of a partying lifestyle. He knows it's destructive. He knows he drinks too much, he knows it imperils his future, but he's a new Christian and he's just trying to find his way. A few weeks before Labor Day, he told me who he was going to spend Labor Day with and in what environment he was going to be in. I just laughed and I said, there's no way, you're dead. You're going to be hung over for three days. There's no way you can be in that environment with those people and not get stung. He said, Bill, I think I'm strong enough. Anyone want to take a vote how that one turned out? You get in the wrong environment with the wrong people. Who is strong enough? Are you strong enough? I freely admit that I'm not. So what does the book of Proverbs say? Proverbs 13, 20. He who walks with wise people will become wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. You want to become wise? You're going to have to make a very strategic decision and that is to hang around with people who are on the path of wisdom and to hang around a lot less with people who are on the path to folly. Because we're affected in ways we don't even like to admit by the people we hang with. One thing we should never get fuzzy about is this. As Christians, we are intended to grow not alone, but together. Christ said where two or three are together, there I am with them. The author of Hebrews implores us by saying, don't give up meeting together as some are in the bad habit of doing. But get together, encourage each other. Jesus had a final prayer before approaching the cross. This was his only recorded prayer specifically about his future followers, which is us. 
This prayer was all about the way we would come together. He prayed we would find the kind of unity with each other that he experienced with the Father. Sounds like a pretty high bar, but that's the picture Jesus had in mind in building his church. The very meaning of the word church means a coming together. We can't be the church alone. Christianity is intended to be a community where no one stands alone. You know, I want to pause here for a moment and just speak for myself as a private Christian. I can't imagine going more than a week or two without community in my life. If you've ever tasted this kind of Christian bond of community before, you know there's nothing like it. If not, my hope and prayer is that all of us get a taste of this over the next five weeks to make us hungry for it. Please, for your own sake, lean into your together experience. Make the most of it. Don't hold back. Invest yourself. The sheer fact that you're giving this whole together thing a run tells me that you're on board with this. So let's talk about how to do it. There's actually a right way and a wrong way to do it, after all. Oftentimes, these little Christian gatherings don't live up to their hype. It's not hard to imagine showing up to a group full of strangers that a church tried to match you with, only to realize you would never normally choose to hang out with any of these people. It's a tough start. It's not hard to imagine sitting in a circle with an insufferably long talker. We've all done that. Let's be honest, a lot can go wrong and really mess this all up. How do we gather the right way? People are so confused most of the time about what their inner circle Christian small group community should do when they come together. Should they be reading the Bible? Should they be like rebuking each other right and left? Should they just cuddle each other the whole time, group hugs and so? Should someone get a guitar out of the closet and then start singing so the neighbors get weirded out? Even a small group veteran can get confused about this stuff. What should these gatherings look like? The first thing we need to define is the goal of gathering. We don't gather just for the sake of gathering. When Christians gather, the goal is to become a gathering where everyone grows. Conversely, if you're wondering what a failing small group would look like, it would be a gathering where everyone just got worse as a person. Nobody got any closer to Christ's likeness. Jesus defined what growth is very succinctly. When asked to summarize it all, he simply said, you would love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you would love others as yourself. That's in Luke 10, verse 27. A gathering that grows will be a gathering that fosters increased love for God and increased love for each other over time. This should provide you a model for how to shape and assess your group experience. So let's just break that down. This is your general guideline for what a gathering that grows should look like. We'll be building upon this model in the upcoming weeks. First, love God with all your heart. Your gathering should actually help your heart to become more like the heart of Jesus. This is so important, we're going to spend our whole fourth week simply focused on this one subject. For now, I'll just say this. Sometimes Christians think loving God with our heart doesn't matter all that much. They're tempted to call that stuff emotional or soft-sided stuff that we don't really pay that much attention to. When this gets done the wrong way, you wind up with a heart-shrinking group experience instead of a heart-growing one. Don't make your group a place where people can't safely share what's really going on inside of them at a heart level. Instead, gatherings that grow should be places where people can regularly check in authentically and openly and vulnerably. What about loving God with our souls? What should gatherings that grow look like in this regard? Our souls are intended to be guided along by God's Spirit. As groups, we have to pay attention to this. In Revelation 3, Jesus says to one of the churches, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone will open the door, I'll come in. One thing that's often missed with this passage is that Jesus isn't talking to those outside the church. He's talking to those who were sitting in a circle every week at the church gathered in his name. We have to realize it's quite possible to gather in Christ's name and for him to be standing outside the circle waiting for us to invite him in. The way we do this is simply through prayer. Prayer is something that we want you to incorporate into your group from day one. So let's talk about this for a moment. 
For starters, I highly suggest that you begin every small group with prayer. This is a great practice to center everyone. It reminds you of why you came together in the first place. So each week when you come together, have someone pray on behalf of the group. It doesn't have to be a long, flashy prayer. It can be as simple as saying, Lord, we're coming together in your name for your sake. Please use this time to accomplish your will in our lives. We make all of ourselves available to be used in any way. So help us, God. Amen. Beginning with prayer is basic stuff, but there's a place for more advanced prayer needs. Most weeks of a small group, someone will be facing real challenges. We're going to be learning a lot over the coming weeks how to help people when, when they're in a place like that. But one thing we can never neglect in these instances is prayer. At the end of the day, every one of us needs the Spirit as our counselor, as our guide, as our healer, as our helper. This is why one of the most common practices in the church throughout the centuries has been prayer through the laying on of hands. Now, I know this can sound mystical. You can be tempted to avoid it. I think that'd be a mistake. When someone really needs prayer, it's appropriate for the one or two people right around them to lay hands on them as you pray. This does not have to be everyone in the circle. It might just be one person. And I would suggest you just put your hand on their shoulder. You don't have to touch someone's head or touch their leg and make them feel uncomfortable. Take it from a Dutch guy. You don't have to get all that touchy. Just put your hand on someone's shoulder. Have someone from the group volunteer to pray rather than picking someone to pray so that someone can just offer themselves. I recommend that one or maybe two people pray in most of these situations. Jesus taught us to pray succinctly. Don't make someone sit there for a half hour. Just have one or two people pray and keep their prayers simple, succinct. When you pray, simply name the need and ask God to intercede with his help. Lord, would you help John to forgive his son? Would you help Laura to find a job? Would you help Sarah to find peace? Make sure you're careful not to insert your own judgments or analysis into a prayer unless you feel very certain about them. If someone tells you about their marital problems and the person praying is talking about casting demons out of their home, and so this is a little off base, gang. You're assuming this is a spiritual warfare issue when it might not actually be. Don't add your assumptions or your advice to any prayer. You know, be careful about that. Just pray for God's help. God knows the reason and, and he'll support that person. If you ever doubt the importance of simple and succinct prayers of faith, just remember the picture of Jesus standing at the door of your group and knocking. He would just like to come in. He would like to work. He only wants to do what he's being asked to do. Prayer opens the door in so many ways. Don't forget that gatherings that grow stop to pray for each other. What about gatherings that grow us in the love of God with our minds? Romans 12.2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. We're going to be talking quite a bit about this in session three, about the role we play in helping each other to think as Christ thinks. But for now, you just need to know that gatherings that grow discuss and apply scriptural truth to each other's lives. Some groups might check in with the question, what did God shape in you through the scripture this week? Other groups might pick a subject matter each week to discuss as a group. Every group is different. But gatherings that grow us in the love of God and others include a check-in at a heart level and prayer and conversations about biblical truth. Finally, groups that grow improve in loving God with their strength. James says if you ponder biblical truths all day, but you don't go away and then do something about it, it's a huge mistake. A healthy group always makes sure they have a practical step that they're going to take to do life better and they share what that is with the rest of the group. This can come in a lot of different ways, and we'll give detailed coaching on this specifically in week three. But for now, remember that groups that grow always leave with practical actions they're going to do. Heartfelt check-ins, soul-engaging prayer, mind-renewing truth from Scripture, and a practical action step 
are all a part of a group that helps everyone in the group to grow. Finally, gatherings that grow help us to learn how to love others as well. What better a place to practice this than in a group? What does loving well in a group context look like? First, it looks like listening. James says to be quick to listen, to be slow to speak. If you want to love well in your group, you'll make it your general goal to listen to others way more than you talk yourself. The greatest killer of a group is the one person who talks all the time and no one else gets to share anything. Don't be that person. Two, loving well means focusing more on others than on your own stories of accomplishments or experiences. If you back up every point in a group with a story of you or your kids, life is going to get old fast. Before you launch into a several minute story, make sure the goal is to focus on others and not just to bring all the focus onto yourself. Three, loving well in group also means confidentiality. The moment someone shares something in the group and later on it finds its way out into some rumor mill, the safety of that group is over. Don't let it happen to your group. Four, loving well also means the right balance of grace and truth. The moment someone feels that you're against them or that you're judging them, uh, the show's over. Truth can only be received well when a person is 100% confident that the other person loves them and wants what's best for them. Earn your place to speak the truth by giving grace first. If someone is bent on feeling self-righteous and is always throwing rocks from the high ground, they probably don't belong in a group. They've got some work to do outside a group. Finally, loving well also means keeping commitments and honoring each other's time. If you keep showing up late when you're meeting with your small group, that doesn't honor other people's time very well. Let your word be your word. Let your yes be your yes, your no be your no. Show up when the rest of the group says they're going to show up. If you have a reading assignment, read the assignment. Have kind of a team spirit in this, and you'll find that that really helps the spirit of your group. As I close, I remember one of the first groups that Len and I held in our home. Uh, at that time, we were living right next to the campus here at Willow. We invited three other couples to join us in this small group experience. And I want to tell you, it started a little rocky. We had some different personalities in the group. But we decided, you know, we're going to stay at this. We're going to try to love each other. We're going to listen to each other's stories. And we did pray together. And we stayed together for two years, actually. We're only asking you for five weeks. But we stayed together for two years. We memorized scripture together. And God did something in each one of our lives. Most of these people are still around the church. And when I bump into them in the hallways or out in the parking lot, we look at each other. And we go, man, God did something in that group experience that we enjoyed in our home for those two years. Now, again, you're just going to do something for five weeks now. But who knows where it could lead? And uh, groups have transformed my life. And I think they have the opportunity and the very realistic chance that they'll change yours as well. So I cheer you on. Give this a good shot. And I think God will reward your efforts.